Welcome back to Harbour Unboxed, or Harbour Boxed. Just quickly remind you guys that for the next week or so, we do have our limited edition Harbour Box hoodies and t-shirts on sale, as well as Hammer on Box. So if you're keen on those, make sure you grab one now so you don't miss out. Now, on to today's video. And since a lot of you seem to be really enjoying the massive GeForce RTX 2060 Super, 2070 Super, and Radeon RX 5700 XT updated game benchmarks, I've gone back and added another heavily requested GPU the mighty GeForce GTX 1080 Ti. Now it seems many of you just can't get enough of the GTX 1080 Ti. Really has become quite the iconic GPU. And I suppose for good reason. From day one, I was impressed with what Nvidia managed to achieve here. Sure, the cost per frame wasn't great, but this is a flagship GPU designed to enable a level of performance that had never been seen before, and it did just that. When compared to AMD's flagship at the time, the Radeon R9 Fury X, the 1080 Ti was an incredible 60% faster on average at 4K and up to 30% faster than the GTX 1080. This performance was made possible by a staggering 3,584 CUDA cores, and that's 17% more than the previous generation's Titan part. But even more incredibly was the fact that they were clocked almost 50% higher. So for roughly a year and a half, the GTX 1080 Ti was the most powerful GeForce GPU on the market, but the love high-end gamers seemed to have for this GPU was only amplified when Nvidia showed at the door with their latest GeForce 20 series. On September 20th, 2018, Nvidia released the GeForce RTX 2080 at the same $700 US price point. At least for AIB models, the Founders Edition version would set you back a further $100, which was a bit of a scam, but whatever, we won't, we won't get caught up on that, I'll just move on because the FE version wasn't the real problem here. The problem was the RTX 2080 was just 1% faster on average in our day one review, and it wasn't even a situation where we were getting the same performance for the same money with a few extra features such as DLSS and ray tracing. And that's because by that point, the GTX 1080 Ti was no longer priced at $700 US, but rather was commonly selling for as low as $600 in mid 2018. This means at the time, even if the RTX 2080s were available at the base MSRP price of $700 US, gamers were still faced with having to dish out at least 20% more, and what they were getting for that extra investment wasn't evident at the time. As benchmarks showed in all their favourite games, they stood to gain little to no extra performance. This had many gamers actively hunting for the remaining GTX 1080 Ti stock, and once that dried up, the used market became a popular target. Less educated gamers, or perhaps those that bought into the ray tracing hype, were selling their GTX 1080 Ti's for as little as $400, which in hindsight was a steal at the time. Today though, prices have actually increased, and now you're looking at having to spend closer to $500 for a used GTX 1080 Ti. So how does the now three-year-old Pascal GPU compare to the modern $400 and $500 US options? Well, we're about to find out with a comprehensive 35 game benchmark. For testing, we have 35 games, and as usual, we'll take a close look at the results for about a dozen of the games tested, then jump into a 35 game performance breakdown. All testing has been conducted using our Core i9 1900K GPU test system clocked at 5GHz with 16GB of DDR4-3400 memory. As for the resolutions, we're covering 1080p and 1440p, but the focus of the discussion will be on the 1440p data. Okay, let's get into the results. First up, we have Call of Duty Modern Warfare, and despite using DirectX 12, the GTX 1080 Ti is still able to get the better of the RTX 2070 Super and 5700 XT, though it has to be said performance is very comparable. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to add the RTX 2080 to the results, but the 2070 Super and RTX 2080 are fairly evenly matched. Not quite as similar as what we see with the RTX 2060 Super and RTX 2070, but there's really not that much more in it. All in all though, the old 1080 Ti is killing it here with higher refresh rate performance at 1440p. Next up we have Ghost Recon Breakpoint, and looking at the 1440p data, we see that the GTX 1080 Ti and 2070 Super are very evenly matched, which is what you'd typically expect to see given the 2070 Super is similar to the RTX 2080. That said, I had expected the 1080 Ti to drop off a little bit with the new Vulkan implementation, but it seems as though Nvidia is still optimizing for the Pascal GPUs here. So again, a strong result for the aging flagship GPU. Shadow of the Tomb Raider was released just before the Turing GPUs, like a week or two before, so it is still well optimized for Pascal. As a result, the GTX 1080 Ti again delivers comparable performance to the RTX 2070 Super, 
and this time also the 5700 XT. That means using the highest in-game quality settings, you're looking at well over 60 FPS at all times when gaming at 1440p. The Gears 5 results are also quite interesting as here we see a situation where the GTX 1080 Ti and its many more cores is able to comfortably beat the RTX 2070 Super. Here we're looking at a 14% performance boost at 1440p, taking us from 80 FPS to just over 90 FPS. So again, an excellent result for the now three-year-old Pascal GPU. Here we have a new title in control that has been heavily optimized for the Turing architecture, and as a result, the GTX 1080 Ti suffers, only delivering comparable performance to that of the RTX 2070 and 5700 XT. Still, it's hardly poor performance, but with some optimization work, I'm quite confident the GTX 1080 Ti could certainly do better here. Moving on, we have Metro Exodus, and here the GTX 1080 Ti does very well, beating the RTX 2070 Super by a convincing 10% margin, and this also placed it ahead of the 5700 XT, which also happens to do quite well in this title with hair works disabled. Impressively, at 1440p, we're looking at over 90 FPS at all times in our benchmark pass, so great stuff here from the GTX 1080 Ti. And I should just note that we don't use the built-in benchmark for a lot of these games, Metro Exodus included, so some people were confused by why the results differed from the built-in benchmark. The custom pass that we're using can be seen in the top left corner of this graph for those wondering. We often show the benchmark footage used there. Resident Evil 3 is yet another game where the GTX 1080 Ti does well, again delivering over 90 FPS at all times to beat the 2070 Super by a 9% margin and the 5700 XT by a 17% margin. This really is excellent performance at 1440p in one of the newest titles we have to test with. Next up we have Doom Eternal, and this is a pretty good example of Nvidia prioritizing the Turing architecture. Even so, the GTX 1080 Ti hardly makes out poorly with an average of 126 FPS at 1440p, and while that meant it was 13% slower than the 2070 Super, it was still 6% faster than the 5700 XT. Playing Fortnite with the new DirectX 12 mode sees the GTX 1080 Ti delivering comparable performance to that of the 2070 Super, so just over 100 FPS on average at 1440p. Again, this is excellent performance, and with competitive quality settings, you'll see frame rates far exceed the refresh rate of high-speed panels. Now, this is an interesting set of results. Testing with PlayerUnknown's Battleground sees the GTX 1080 Ti beat the 2070 Super by a 12% margin, pushing over 140 FPS. This meant it was a whopping 36% faster than the 5700 XT, though it has to be said PUBG isn't a particularly AMD-friendly title. Not unlike what we saw in PUBG, and even earlier in Gears 5, the 1080 Ti is notably faster than the 2070 Super in Borderlands 3, particularly at 1440p when comparing the 1% low data. The GTX 1080 Ti is basically on par with the 5700 XT, which performs exceptionally well in this title, so another strong result for the old Pascal GPU. And last up, we have Battlefield 5 using the DirectX 12 API, and here the GTX 1080 Ti is comparable with the 5700 XT and 2070 Super. Again, solid performance at 1440p, given we're looking at over 100 FPS on average, so a strong result to finish up this dozen game examination. As you might have expected, the GTX 1080 Ti is still a bit of a beast, even by today's standards, and based on that dozen game sample, it looked to be very competitive with the RTX 2070 Super, and that made it a little bit faster than the 5700 XT. But before we close the book on the benchmarks, let's take a look at the 35 game breakdown graphs. Well, it was very competitive with the RTX 2070 Super indeed, beating it by a 2% margin overall, though as always, anything under a 5% margin we deem to be a draw. It is interesting to see where the core heavy Pascal GPU shines, games such as World of Tanks, Gears 5, PUBG, War Thunder, and so on. It's also interesting to see which games are optimized for Turing and or the games where Nvidia has optimized as drivers for Turing. Games such as Control, Doom Eternal, Apex Legends, Rainbow Six Siege, Youngblood, and Strange Brigade, for example. Still, I have to say, for the most part, where the GTX 1080 Ti was slower, it wasn't a great deal slower. Moving on to the breakdown with the Radeon RX 5700 XT, and here we see overall that the GTX 1080 Ti was 11% faster on average at 1440p. That's not a huge difference, but it's starting to get up there, and we do see gains of almost 40% in some titles. So if you look at this as a $700 GPU versus a $400 GPU, that's not too bad for AMD. But for those of you shopping secondhand, you can still see why the GTX 1080 Ti is a compelling option. 
Okay, so the GeForce GTX 1080 Ti still looks to be a very solid GPU in 2020. And when compared to the RTX 2070 Super, it is very similar in terms of performance. So if it were a brand new product that was going on sale today, you'd expect an asking price of about $500 and that would make it 30% cheaper than where it started three years ago. So that's a depreciation rate of 10% per year. That being the case, what would you expect to pay for a three-year-old graphics card that probably doesn't have any warranty left that can deliver comparable performance to a modern $500 GPU or about 10% more performance than a $400 model? Assuming you have eyes for only the green team, I'd say at least $100. A $100 discount is in order for those shopping secondhand. Ideally, I think you'd like to get at least $150 off, and that would put the GTX 1080 Ti at $350 US, and I have in the past seen them going for that price. However, having recently put together a massive 80 GPU used buying guide, I was surprised to find the average selling price of used GTX 1080 Ti's $475 US, and that price only seems to have increased. Bizarrely, people are spending over $500 US on used GTX 1080Ti's on eBay.com, and they appear to be selling in rather large volumes. It makes no sense to purchase a GTX 1080Ti at this price when you can just get an RTX 2070 Super for the same $500. You would just do that, surely. Alternatively, for $400, the Radeon RX 5700 XT is our go-to option. And as I said in my last video, the ASRock 5700 XT Challenger has been going for just $350 US, and it's a steal at that price. You can also, of course, get yourself a non-XT 5700 series card, and a lot of people like to flash those, and you do get quite similar performance to a 5700 XT, though make sure you do buy one with a good cooler if you plan on doing that. But the point is, if you want to save some money and still achieve GTX 1080 Ti Lite performance, get a 5700 series graphics card. So taking that all on board, I think secondhand GTX 1080 Ti's are a hard pass at anything over $350 US. And even then, I'd look to spend no more than $300, particularly given there are quite a few cheap 5700 series graphics cards getting around. You also have to wonder how many more games in the future we're going to see, like Doom Eternal and Control, for example, that play much better with Turing-based GPUs. I suspect with the next generation of NVIDIA GPUs not that far away, Pascal could start to age quite noticeably over the next year. And that is going to do it for this one. If you enjoyed the video, you can do the YouTube things, like, subscribe if you haven't already, but yeah, make sure you hit that like button for us. That does help out, I think. Uh, who knows? I'm just saying things. <laughs> we also have Harbour Boxed and Hammer on Box if you're interested in the new meme merch. I think they're really cool, look awesome, and a bit of fun. Uh, so yeah, make sure you do order those now if you are interested, because as I said, it's a limited time only thing. May not bring those back. Uh, Patreon. We do have Patreon, so if you want to become a member, you can do so for as little as $1 per month. That gets you access to our monthly live stream. That's coming up next week, so you can watch that live, ask two of myself questions, or just engage with the live stream. It's always a lot of fun. Our exclusive Discord chat, that's also awesome. Great place if you want to go and talk about this kind of stuff without having to deal with the fanboys and getting attacked and all the carrying on that tends to happen. Though the YouTube comment section is generally pretty good, but Computer forums these days can be a bit toxic, so none of that on our Discord. It is not tolerated or allowed, so it's a great place if you want to come and have a mature discussion about PC hardware. So Tim and I certainly love doing that. Uh, yeah, I think that's... What else have we got? I think that's everything. I don't know. I'm very tired. I've done way too much benchmarking this week, and we have some exciting new products coming up on the channel over the next few weeks. So I've got to shift gears and get into that. So thank you for watching. I'm your host, Steve, and I'll see you again next time.